Let's see, and I just heard somebody like opening the, ah. Hey, everybody. Hey, hey. woo! <laughs> we are absolutely thrilled that you are here at our breakout session. We're gonna explore GitHub Copilot in Visual Studio. We have two choices for you. One, we have about, about 60 slides and about 45 minutes, or, or no slides and just three people with three laptops and only demos. Yeah. Woo! All right. We like that? Yes. OK, cool. We're going to do that. We have no cameras, so we have the camera app on Windows. Say hi. I'm Scott Hanselman. You are? I am Dahlia. <laughs> I'm Jesse Houghton. All right. And we are here to kick butt and have a lot of fun. So um, in GitHub Copilot came out maybe a year and a half ago. When did it come out? When was the official like launching? Couple of years. Yeah. A couple of years, yeah. Couple years, much. And in my opinion, and this is my opinion, not Microsoft's opinion, for a while there during the early gold rush of AI, we would just see a chat bot attached to an app. And it's like, here's an app, and here's a thing on the right, and it's the chat bot that you talk to. And some of them were integrated and some of them weren't, but this was early days. I am here to kind of reintroduce GitHub Copilot to you, especially in Visual Studio, because there is a lot more interesting stuff that is happening that is allowing that chatbot to exist outside the context of that box on the right and integrate deeply into all of the things within Visual Studio that are going to remove toil. The whole point is to make your job more fun and to make the boring parts less boring. Is that a fair statement? Yes. So Dahlia and Jesse are both PMs on Copilot. So they live and breathe all of this stuff. So if I make any mistakes, they're going to let me know that I'm wrong about that because they're the ones that designed it. So that's going to be really awesome. Now, let's switch over to my uh, system right here. And I just want to call out some new stuff that has happened here on GitHub Copilot chat within Visual Studio on the right-hand side. These are called icebreakers. One of the things that we've noticed is that people don't really know how to interact, particularly with the chat interface, which is my preferred way of doing things. We're also going to showcase how everyone does things differently. We are three different people who code differently. I really like the chat bot. I'm a bit of a yapper, as the kids say. So when we see how I use it, my interaction model is going to be different than Dahlia's and Jesse. But a lot of people find themselves here, and they realize that, like, I don't know what I can do, and, and what can I say, and how can I interact with this, and can I even get into deeper things like concepts and web searches? So these icebreakers allow you to do stuff like that. So I can go and say something like, explain these programming concepts, because it's nothing like a senior engineer asking a question like, what's the difference between this thing in Git and that thing in Git? Because I only know how to do git commit and git reset hard head, <laughs> right? which I think are the two main ways that I interact with, uh, with git. So something like rebase and merge is super important. Being able to do that and have that icebreaker gives my life, makes my life a little bit easier. The other thing that's really cool is notice this here in the corner. It's convenient that Racinovich is here. So Mark, in Zoomit, when something pops up, and then you zoom in, sometimes it fades away, and you have to catch it. That's a Windows bug. It's a Windows bug. <laughs> so Mark has just punted on that, takes no responsibility for that, and it blames the Windows team. OK, so I want to call out two interesting things. Notice how code has uh, underlined itself. It's a keyword. It's recognized as something. You know, maybe code, file, solution, class, these are different keywords that call out my, a way that I can maybe be more explicit about my intent. In my interactions with Copilot, I like being really explicit. While, Dahlia, you prefer to be more implicit, and you just talk to it, and you want it to just figure stuff out. Yes, do it for me. Do it for me. So in this case here, I could say, explain how the code in this works, and then go ahead and run it. And you'll notice that it says, explain how the code in. And I've given it explicit permission. I have given it explicit context to say, go over there and tell me about that. Now, Copilot could just do it based on me typing the, the file name, because it can see what's going on. But I really like that level of being explicit. So I love doing that hashtag um, indicator there to be able to talk to that. The other thing that I can do is that let's go ahead and um, write some, some error. Let's error out some code here. So this is my podcast website. I'm just going to make a, a mistake and put in some nonsense here. I don't usually uh, have any bugs, of course. In my, in my code, so I'm going to have to explicitly introduce a bug. 
I know it's hard, but uh, just try to assume that a bug happened and ignore these 50 warnings because <laughs> I just want to remind you that if it's a triangle, it's OK. <laughs> All right? So it's true. Did you know that? <laughs> you didn't know that there's triangles are fine. That's what I was taught. Is that <laughs> what's the deal <laughs> with? And see how I can say hashtag and it pops up errors? So it actually knows that those errors are there. And I'm basically saying, go check that context. What's going on with the deal there? You think what the, what's the deal is a way that you should talk to a GitHub co Is it that? Why not? It's totally fine. It's thinking, though. Oh, and look at that. And it has a conversation with me. I think of my interactions with GitHub Copilot as being like a really eager junior engineer or a really eager and patient intern. It's never going to have a problem with me. It's never going to talk back, which is really exciting. I don't know why. I didn't have them have GitHub Copilot do the session with me. Because <laughs> you've been super mean in practice. Oh. <laughs> so here it's actually giving me the error, and it saw that context, that saw that context in, uh, in hashtag errors. That is super interesting. I can go and reference things within my uh, conversation, and I can say, tell me more about. And when I go like this, I could even start typing um, names of methods or fields or classes. And that's a model that you're used to because you see that when you do autocomplete. When you do IntelliSense over in your editor, you expect that. You should expect the same kind of ability inside of Copilot Chat. I really like that because it's very explicit, which is how I work. Now, in this case, though, I haven't shown anything happening between these two chatbots. It's just kind of like there's the chat and there's the, the code. And I understand that having those things talk to each other is something that's a passion of yours. I love that, yes. So for me, I work differently. I think the VS should do it for you. In my mind, I think the more the tool does what you need it to do for you, the better, because then we're not putting that burden on the user to figure out, OK, how do I prompt it? Let me prompt it exactly right. Um, and we've been able to do more now that we have this capability called function calling. And what function calling lets us do is we talk to the model and tell it, hey, not only are you getting this prompt, but here are some things that you can do because we are in VS. For example, maybe you can set a breakpoint. Maybe you can run a test. Maybe you can do a lot of other functions because you're in Visual Studio. You're not in a browser or whatever it is. And I think that tight integration will be more likely to yield better results. So There was a thing many years ago called Ole Automation or Com Automation. And now you can do script things like Word and Excel and tell them to do stuff. So you're scripting Visual Studio and doing things that the user could do themselves. But you can reach across the divide. Yes. That's yes. cool. Let me show you an example. Mm -hmm. So here I have a failing test. Um, test zoom, two. Zoom. Zoom your, in. Your right. is here. You have to use the All zoom. right. All right. Here we go. Here we go. We have a test here, and it's failing. We have the failure over here. And what we've done is we've added an option here uh, that's called debug with Copilot. So you're going to click on this. And what's going to happen, I'm going to zoom out again if you're OK with that. I'm OK with that. Okay, I think okay. that's acceptable. So we zoomed out. So here's what's happening here. What's happening is that we are sending this prompt to the model. We're starting uh, Visual Studio in debug mode. We're starting this application in debug mode. And notice what's, ha what's at the top here. I'm going to just scroll up so you can see what's happening here. These are all functions. Got to zoom again, sorry. <laughs> see, I love that. I love this. This feels verbose to me. I, am I the first thing I do on any machine on any, is it change it to verbose mode. I want to see all the logs. I like that you're hiding nothing from me. Don't you love that? No. <laughs> All right. So we had this argument back and forth with the design team and the engineering team because the engineers are like, oh, I want to be very verbose. I want to tell you everything I'm doing. And I'm thinking, like, that is too much information. It's like when you send a prompt and there's so much detail and you're like, just get to the point. What are, what are you telling me to do? So these are arguments we're having. Mm -hmm. We've landed on verbose for now. Yes. So we'll see. we'll see what happens. <laughs> so what's happening here is... We sent the model. We told it, hey, this is a stack. This is a failure stack. This is the method. Do you recommend adding any breakpoints anywhere? And it came back and said, yes, add these breakpoints in line 24, line 37. This is from the model. Visual Studio is going to take that and actually set the breakpoints for you and tell you, hey, uh, this is my uh, plan, and I think you should 
move on and let's see, let's look at the values and see if we can come up with something to uh, suggest for you. So this is the follow-up. It went to my method and it set the breakpoint. You can see it here on the left side here. And then it told me, hey, this is the values at this point. And if it can suggest a fix at this point, it will give you some suggestions at the bottom here that says suggest a code fix or continue debugging. If the model finds out it can't suggest a fix, uh -huh. it will just tell you, hey, continue debugging. Mm. Make sense? Can you zoom in on that for just a second? Yes. Because I want to call something out here. Again, fast, you know, back up a year or two when you first were introduced to Copilot, how you felt about it and what you saw. You may have been enamored. You may have said, yeah, it's cool, whatever. In this example here, the context wasn't just open tabs. It wasn't just the code that you selected. It wasn't the code you pasted in. The context included the watch window, the call stack, what's, what's happening. The context is, is temporal context. And it literally knows, and it's helping you. At the, just a little bit above this, it said, let's step through and like see how it's going. And then now down here, you could probably continue to just click on those. And those are function calling, is that right? Those are like the follow-up prompt. Okay. Or you're, tell, you're coming back and saying, hey, let Visual Studio continue debugging or suggest a good fix. Mm. But the nice thing about this is like, notice, if you're doing this in ChatGPT, you're not in an IDE. But the fact that you're doing this in an ID is so much more powerful because we can send the model some information about what you can and can't do. So in this case, it actually thinks it has a fix. So we're going to click on that and see what happens. So we told it, hey, please suggest a fix. Scroll and down. it's, oh, there we go. And it's adjusted a fix. So we're going to preview it so we can just look at the changes here. Right, and this again, it cannot be overstated that because you're in Visual Studio, you have the power of Visual Studio. Again, we didn't just copy paste a bunch of crap into ChatGPT, which is not allowed by corporate. And you just kind of yeeted your code directly into a third party. And then it's not running your code, right? It's just guessing. It's rolling the dice. Here, it actually ran your code. And with that additional context, it, it learned. And then she didn't just paste it into the editor. You get a diff. Yes. That's my favorite thing about this, is because a lot of times I'm like, oh, what are you suggesting here? So you can take your time reviewing it, thinking, OK, does this make sense? Mm -hmm. And then once you accept it, you can choose what you want to do next. Do you want to stop debugging? Well, I'm kind of done. Let me just stop debugging here and see what it suggests. In this case, it's going to stop debugging. And it's going to tell me, hey, do you want to rerun that field test that field earlier? So we're going to click on that and see what happens. Hopefully, this lands well. Do, 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 do. Remember, there are no demo gods. There's only you and being prepared. <laughs> hey! So, I don't like it when people blame the demo gods. <laughs> that was great. Good job. Yeah, so in this case, it passed. You can start a debug session again and do whatever you would like. But I really want to point out how powerful it is that there's function calling now. We're planning to do more and more uh, you know, sending the model some information about what you can and cannot do. But this is not the only function calls we're adding, like adding breakpoints. There's another one that I really like, and one that is um, a function call that goes off to the web and searches for you. Because before, a lot of times, if you ask it a question that, about something that has happened in the last year, um, well, the model hasn't been trained it's with the data. Time capsule problem. Exactly, exactly. And what you can do is now you can say, you, yeah, can you tell me um, about, let's say, .NET Aspire, which came out this year. What's happening here is we're going to detect that the question you just asked needs a web search for you. This is where I think from a, a builder of a tool that we should do this for you. Mm. And you think the explicit way is the way to right. go. Right. I was like, well, you should say slash web or whatever. And yeah. I think the point is you get choice. Yes. Yes. So I'm all about doing this implicitly. So what happened here is, oh, I searched the web. I came up with an answer that's actually accurate. And I give you a link to the official .NET Aspire documentation. And we give you the references. This is, these are the links that we went off to and found for you to give you that answer. Yeah, and this idea of the references, if you could zoom in on that for just yes. a second, is so important because if you're creating one of these for yourself, if you're making a chatbot, if you're making a, uh, an AI of any kind, you've got to tell the customer and the user why you think that. 
where did this context come from? You can't just make stuff up. Now, there's no guarantee that it didn't make something up. Always trust but verify. But here it's saying, well, based on these five things that I Googled with Bing for, read, ingested, and then based on what you asked, this is what I think, just like an intern would. Trust, trust the intern did their work, and then verify. We've actually found out that the de uh, developers really like this references list because the more they know how it came up with the answer, the more likely it's going to be able to correct it. So they know how to use the tool more, and then they're more likely to be like, no, 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 look over here, and then come back with a better answer. So this is really great for that. Um, so that's function calling, and we're going to be adding more and more uh, functions if I can zoom out here. Mm -hmm. um, and um, but I do want to talk about something else. Okay. So this is just implicitly calling functions, but the other really cool thing that we've added um, is the ability to call other extensions, other GitHub Copilot extensions, and that opens up a whole ecosystem of other folks uh, that want to build their extensions on top of GitHub Copilot. So let me give you an example. When you install GitHub Copilot chat, you actually get a default extension for GitHub. And what this one is going to do, it's going to go off to GitHub itself and ask it questions about your repository. So let's say I want a list of all my, so let's see, list all my assigned issues. Is, an, is that an agent? We're not calling it agents. <laughs> We're calling it extensions. <laughs> that's an agent. <coughs> okay, that's but interesting. it acts like an agent. Yes. Like it knows how to do certain tasks. I have just found them. in meetings when people say, well, that's an agentic flow, I feel smart. <laughs> so I want to know if they can say that, if it's an agentic flow. I guess something. it's not smart. It's an extensive flow. <laughs> it hurt you, Scott. I couldn't retrieve them. Let's try it again. Might be permissions thing. Oh, there, oh, there it is. You go. Oh. oh, it crashed. Boy. It's OK that it crashed. Let's try it. And if it doesn't work, that's OK. It's all why do things like, theoretically, why is that going wrong? Why do things go wrong? Is it because that agent, or that, sorry, that extension is making a call, and then the API call didn't work? or whatever. There's a lot of like things that could go wrong is going off to the intern, like GitHub calling it, coming back, parsing it on our end, mm -hmm. like things can go wrong, but it went right this is, time. Is this a preview? This is, this is already in the product. Okay. So you can call today, you can call at GitHub and ask you these questions. So in this case, if you can see here, it actually gave me the list of my assigned issues. So you don't have to do your own query or whatever you want to do. Um, on GitHub, it actually will do that for you in Visual Studio, which I think is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say, let's give you another example of another extension. Okay. Oh, <laughs> hang on. What is going on there? That, so, okay. So this <laughs> happened when I installed the Mermaid Chart uh, extension. Uh, it broke our UI um, because we did not expect such a nice description that's very <laughs> long. So thank you, uh, folks at Mermaid Chart. Uh, we, we do have a fix for it, but I just didn't want to update my build today. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so if I love this extension because you can say, hey, at Mermaid, maybe you want to have a class diagram. So you say, hey, at Mermaid, um, can you generate a class diagram? for, let's say, basket class. And what's awesome about this is that it's not just extensions that are built by Microsoft and GitHub. It's also extensions by our partners like Docker, Stack Overflow, so on and so forth. So in this case, I just asked the Mermaid chart extension, hey, can you generate a class diagram for me? And it went off and it took the information about the class and it created uh, the mermaid syntax here, and here, here it is. And there's also a link here that goes to the... Uh, their website. Yes, their website, and you can see the chart right here. So I think, I think that's really cool. Um, if you want, you can check out some of the marketplace extensions and just choose your favorite. We have like Docker, Perplexity, Mermaid Chart, whatever you'd like to install, and mm -hmm. then just get it right there. And theoretically, I could write one of those if I wanted to. Yes, well. you can. I actually wrote my own. I called it really? my agent. Okay, cool. 
<laughs> Your agent extension? Yes. Nice. Ex extension. My agent. It's not an agent at all, though. We yes. don't say agent. No, no, so no. I don't know why you not, would call it that. It's not smart. It doesn't oh do my anything. God. Wait, I have a question, Dahlia. So can, does this only work in Visual Studio when you download that from GitHub, or where can you use it in other places? Great question. So if you build a GitHub Copilot app, it will work in Visual Studio, VS Code, and GitHub.com. Awesome. You don't have to build it for each client. You can have it built once and work everywhere. I love that question. All right, we need to speed up. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. No, don't apologize, All right. you're killing so, it. Great so, job. this is the extensions, mm -hmm. love that. The other thing that I wanna fo focus on is the way that I like to use my ID is that I actually don't think to go to the chat much and we've heard a lot of developers say that. So we're integrating Copilot in a lot of in the flow uh, points. So for example, let's say we go back to that test class and these names are terrible. They're not very descriptive. So I go to rename it, and now you get suggestions on what to name your method based on what the method is doing, because that's basically what you want your identifier to be. It should be a summary of what the method is doing. So you can choose that, rename it, and so move on. And what's cool about that is that you didn't ask it anything. It just was a little delighter that you sprinkled in there where AI just made something better and made something less tedious. Exactly. So that, those are some of the things that I love uh, using, and I'd love to go back to you and hear more about how you like to use it. Okay, so switching back over to my machine, um, I noticed recently down here in the corner, there is this choice that says GPT-4.0. Again, this came out after uh, Copilot was uh, released, so it has gotten smarter already just because the back end has changed. But it's worth pointing out that you can pick different models. So, Claude is an option. So just like you might pick SQL Server or Postgres because you have a preference for some feature or something, we are finding that people on Reddit, people, um, are having these like, oh, Claude is way better. Oh no, dude, JP, GPT is way better. I don't know how Reddit people talk. Um, GPT is way better. You're gonna find how you talk vibes with one model because different models have different personalities. They were trained in different ways. So you're gonna be able to pick the ones that work the way you want. Some people have said anecdotally or anecdotally, depending on how you measure these things, that well, when I do Claude, it, may, it gives me much terser and much higher quality text. It doesn't matter, pick the one that makes you happy. We're gonna see a little bit later uh, when Jesse's demo comes up how some of these models have features that other models just don't have and that's gonna be really, really powerful. I prefer to use 4.0 but you can pick Claude or uh, Gemini I guess is happening as well, so that's pretty cool. Now I, as I mentioned before, am a bit of a yapper so I like to talk to this. I, don't, I have some problems with mobility in my hands so I hit Windows H and then I bring up the Windows automatic dictation thing and I talk to Copilot. I think it picked up one. So that little pop up there that said some of the features don't work in this app, that's a Windows accessibility thing that's saying I don't trust this text box. It's not behaving like a text box. But just like Racinovich, I'm gonna blame Windows for that and not GitHub Copilot. I'm thinking about adding some new features to my application, comma, can you suggest some databases that I might use instead of my JSON file? So in, I will talk back and forth. I will have 20 minute long conversations with Copilot. Um, I have been trying to figure out how I would do this, because right now I have to hit Windows H each time. With Visual Studio Code, there's an extension that you can get, but I've always felt like I need like a button or a, an advanced voice mode like we see with ChatGPT's iPhone app, where I can be kind of like um, Scotty in Star Trek IV, when he's like, computer, you know, and he just talks into the base of the mouse. So if you could make that happen, uh, PMs of, I just want to go like this and just have a chat and wander around and talk about it. That has been my interaction model, and I found it to be very satisfying. And I'll say, okay, well, talk to me more about that. Explain to me why I might pick this, or why I pick, might pick that, and then show me sample code on how I would theoretically do it. I find that interaction model really cool, and with the addition of the new um, models, particularly with 4.0, which is super advanced, it's really made my experience a lot better. Last thing I wanted to call out was solution. Tell me about this solution says refer to your solution. So I'm actually telling it, look at the entire solution and tell me something about that entire solution. 
And you'll notice that that is getting the little Visual Studio icon there. So that, that symbol matters. That symbol is important. GPT-40 is a little bit slower than the others. So you might pick one over the other based on performance. Uh, I have found that 4.0 just tends to be a little bit slower. So look at that. Oh, this appears to be uh, a .NET 8 web application for the podcast by Scott Hanselman that everyone should subscribe to because it's a really great show. <laughs> and look, and it actually is. You like this it's subtle, yeah. And it's walking me through each part of the class. It's almost as if it's writing a book for me. And I really like that. Seems like this Hanselman's a pretty cool guy, comma, way cooler than Racinovich. Oh, I spelled it right. I spelled his name wrong on purpose. <laughs> Do you really want to test that? <laughs> it always goes bad. <laughs> Each with their own unique contributions. Oh, both highly oh. respected figures. Hi, uh, that's crap. <laughs> ah, you cop out. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> All right, so that's how I use it. I love talking to it. How do you, how do you spend time with Copilot, uh, Jesse? So something that I've been really loving to use Copilot for recently is when I've got these kind of hairy, complicated features that I know are going to touch a lot of different files. But maybe I haven't been in that part of the code base before, and I don't know exactly where to start um, or how all of those things are put together. So let's say this is my task. We've got some sale going on. I need to update my web application to include some new text to um, show some banners based off of some logic, if the user's logged in or not. So if I'm in this code base every day, this is not a heavy lift, right? But if I'm coming into this, um, or this is a section I don't take a look at often, it can be annoying and difficult to get started. There's toil in finding the right files to get going. So let's show you what I mean. If I open up Control T, that's going to be my all-in-one search, focused on the code search. And I know that page has something to do with inventory. And it looks like all I'm getting are comments. But did you see this come up? If I zoom in right here, it says, oh, did you mean catalog item.cs? And how did it guess that based on what did you say? I said, I'm you looking said for the inventory. You said inventory, and it figured out it was catalog item. Yeah. That's cool. It was like, is this what you were talking about? Close. I was looking for the page that that's all hosted on. So let's see. Even if I don't get any results in my all-in-one search, did you mean is running in the background and giving me a fuzzy search to kind of get me started, get me where I want to go? So I can go ahead and click on that. And then I've got this great preview window in my all-in-one search. So I know I don't want to look at the hybrid app version. I want to look at the web app, especially when you've got these multifaceted projects that you're working with. There might be multiple files that have the same name. So it's really nice to be able to kind of tell the difference there. And now that I'm started, this is the page that I want to be working with. Let's go ahead and start a new edit section. So create new edit session is a new option up here. Mm -hmm. And then you'll notice that some of these kind of, it's the same icebreakers that we saw before, but they're a little bit more complicated, right? It's like add a whole new feature to my application, refactor my code. These are things that are multi-step things that you might be getting into your zone, figuring out all the context that you might need, uh, understanding the problem, and working through multiple iterations. So that's exactly the kind of thing I'm endeavoring on today. So let's say something like, um, what changes are needed to update my page in CSS from, and then this is where I would go and write a long paragraph about how I want to update the text of the title page and I want it to be um, dependent on the sign in. And so that's a lot of context that I need to add manually. And it's also, context about the UI. So I might end up in this back and forth conversation where Copilot's trying to kind of figure out the picture of what the UI is looking like, but it's not quite getting it. And so you, I've, I've heard this from a lot of folks that it doesn't do a great job with that. So what I'm going to do instead of typing out all of that paragraph is I'm going to take a screenshot of this, which is my current app what it looks like right now. And I'll just paste that into the chat window. And then I'll go over here and I'll grab the new one. Head back over, paste that in. And I say, OK, so what are the changes needed to update my page in CSS from image one to image two? And Copilot edits is this like multi-file 
editing surface. It's going to create a plan and pull with function calling all of those awesome files that have the different things that I need to make those changes. And then Copilot is also going to use GPT-40's image capabilities to read and look at my two images, figure out what was different. And we can even see here, right, it's understanding all the things that I had in that spec that I needed to change. It's figuring that out, figuring what files that map to. It's bringing in this other file. You can see it's generating these edits. And we've got the verbose logging in here Yay. for folks that need to see what did it take a look at to figure out where to go next. And then I get this first iteration. So we talked about how we might be focused on a particular issue. We want Copilot to remember that context and continue to build on that context as I'm working through an issue and understanding more. Um, and then we end up with these iterations, and we can go back to them or proceed forward if we ended up wanting to um, add more logic to the thing that we were working on. I think it's significant that the way that you've designed it is that it knows that this is an iteration. You're not trying to get it right on the first try. You're trying to move the ball forward. And you don't know if the iteration one nailed it or not. Right you're going to see, and then it might take two more, or you might have got it right in the first try. Yeah, exactly. So if I, look a look, if I take a look at my summary, it looks like it understood more about my UI because I gave it that context. But I also want to make sure um, only show this when the user is logged in. So I want it to go back, take a look at the rest of the files, but you figure out where that. show this. Yeah, because it has the context of what we just talked about already. And, and it's, it's going to remember all of those files and come up with a better plan to execute on that intention that I created when I started this thread. Mm. Yeah. It looks at the history of the thread mm -hmm. when it's sending the prompt, which is really great, because yeah. then you don't have to repeat yourself. And this looks a little bit different, right? In our regular chat window, we actually get code blocks. And we can preview those, just like we saw in Dolly's example when we got that code fix. That can be really handy for those small tweaks that you want to add. But sometimes it can be really difficult to visualize what's happening in those code blocks. So let's click on one. You can see there's like a little bar on the left to say that it was streaming in responses. And I have my inline accept, or I can alt slash and ask Copilot to modify this. And so I can really be in the driver's seat, focus on the logic and code that only I can write, and let Copilot do all the toil for me. Do you know why we made the hotkey alt slash? A, I. The slash is like a leaning I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll go ahead and accept that change there, and then I can review the other changes that I want while it's creating a plan for the rest of the logic about the login page. I'll go ahead and open up a new thread here. And I want to show you something else, is that if I've worked on my code in this flow and I want to make sure that it's aligned with my team's coding practices, like. How do we normally do that? There's usually some document that's floating around that tells you, OK, you need to check for all these things, or else someone's going to hammer you on your pull request later. And if you're new or early in career, that's like really disheartening. <laughs> and it makes you a little bit nervous to kind of get that sent out. So if I ask something like, help me ensure my code follows my team's practices. Now, you didn't read the eight-page Word document that we gave you when you joined the team with all of our coding? Because the Word document will surely break the build, right, if you do it wrong? Well, yeah. If I send it in, it's going to tell me exactly if I messed anything up, right? Uh, no, it's not going to break the build. Um, and neither will this, but this will give you a little bit more information. So what it did here, right? OK, it says, let's ensure your code follows your team's best practices. Zoom in. Yeah, I'll zoom in. And it's talking about avoiding inline lambdas, preferring async and awake, avoiding inline styles. How did it know that those are my team's best practices? Is it just guessing? It actually, if I zoom in here, it took a look at the Copilot instructions file. And this is custom instructions, right? This is the idea that everybody has a different workflow. Every team has a different eight-page document to help you get started and has all of those best practices bulleted list for you to make sure you understand. And so we made it flexible. We made it 
so that it allowed you to add your own team's guidelines, however you want to code. It's not just looking at this when I ask questions directly about how my team thinks about something. It's looking at this every time that I'm requesting code changes. So the code that comes back has a better chance of actually aligning with what I want and what my team eventually wants. So there's like a layer of compliance in there too that I'm feeling good about what Copilot is suggesting for me. So this is not replacing editor config and linting and all that kind of stuff. This is the more squishy parts yeah. of, you know, we don't use link at the company. We're afraid of link or whatever yeah. weird thing that the Redditor decided to talk about. Um, there was a whole thread on how the company banned link, the best part of C Sharp, and they banned it. Um, and how long can that be? So we don't want it to be too long because it can start to interfere with some of the responses. And so that's where we need more folks to try this out. Mm. And so we understand, like, what are the boundaries there? How can we ensure a great experience that's tailored to your needs um, without worrying about it uh, messing with the results that are coming out of Copilot? That's so hot. I love that. It's a readme for your Copilot for it to check ahead of time. Yeah. Exactly. That's freaking amazing. I heard you pitch that name and that we went with Copilot. Yeah, the Copilot. original plan, I said Copilot-readme, and they were like, no. <laughs> we're going to still fix it. Give them that feedback. Yeah, yeah. Get in the comments. All right. Um, the next thing. Oh, yeah. Another level of control that we wanted to give folks. Well, first, I'll go ahead and just plug this feature. Um, We've gotten a lot of great feedback on our AI-generated commit message. So if I click on this, it'll actually, oh, it's going to say that I don't have some changes. Let's this is like legit the best thing ever. I freaking love this part. It's one of the most used features for Copilot in Visual Studio. And it's yeah. right there in your commit window. So it's like, I'm getting ready to type it. I should just click the button anyways. Um, one piece of feedback, though, that we got was that some teams are uh, have standards around how they like their commit messages written, or some people just like to make it sound like them, right? Like this sounds like a canned prompt, because it is. Um, that was our best approximation of what most people might want out of this feature. But folks let us know that that's not enough. And what we added is in our options page, you can actually go ahead and add your own custom instructions on top of that commit message to make it sound like you. Well, maybe I can make it sound like Scott Hanselman. I don't know. Do you write your commit messages in you a You can try. See what happens. Way? Yeah. This is going to be scary because it's going to be like, dude, here's my code that you committed. It's awesome. All right. Let's see. And I save that. You're the best. I generate. Keep, keep it up. And now order. it's saying that it's writing a customized message. Did I say? And it's a little less verbose than what we had before. There's nothing mm. super handsome any there. No. I would have put a little inspirational quote at the bottom, but other okay. than that, I think. OK. <laughs> you can do it. So let's say, add some words of wisdom <laughs> into it. And then I can also say that um, we'll sign off. Maybe a quote from Deep Space Nine. <laughs> with made by Jesse, Dahlia, and Scott. At Ignite. And if I save that, come over here. Oh, at Ignite, there we go. And then I'll generate one more time. And again, right, Copilot is looking at that set of changes. It's understanding exactly what you did, and it's going to summarize that. So if we scroll down, any words of wisdom? Remember, code mm -hmm. is like humor. When you have to explain it, it's bad. <laughs> Love it. That is totally, that is awesome. <laughs> words of wisdom. All right, you've got about a minute and a half for that as we. All right, I can do that in a minute and a half. Some folks were probably keying in on this blue text here, um, and for good reason. So we were talking about you know newer and career folks being a little bit nervous about getting hammered on their PR. One thing that can help with that is local code review. So code review before your code even gets pushed, right? What are the kinds of things that we want to catch with this? They might be performance issues, things that you're not going to catch with a compiler error, for example. Like you've done your testing, but these perf things might sneak up on you. So I might be using some threads in an unsafe way here. And let's go to the next comment. It looks like I left this, um, oh, I did this excessively long query string, and that's going to take a long time as well. 
In this one, I actually have a key that I included here for my testing. I commented it out. It wasn't going to mess with my builds or anything, but it's catching that so I don't even check it into the source code. Right? Like, that's amazing because if I didn't have something to catch me on that, I'd accidentally commit that, I would push that, and then it would be live on my, um, on my repository in the web. I'd have to figure out how to get that down. I'd have to do git rebase. I'd have to learn all of the fancy git terminology that we don't normally interact with every day to try and undo that problem. But it's catching that for me so that I don't even run the risk of pushing that up to the server. So That's fantastic. Awesome. All right. That was my last thing. That's fantastic. And I think I Very gave you nice. enough time. <laughs> you, uh, you nailed it with the uh, applause there. People are loving it. So I, I want to leave you with a, a concept. So this is really cool stuff. This is stuff that is, uh, is both future looking. We're going to give you a slide you can take a picture of. It'll tell you exactly what version of Visual Studio you will get each of these features. Every single one of these demos was 100% real. No faking, no hard coding. Some things work, some things didn't work, but I think 99% of everything worked exactly as we would expect because we don't do canned demos. That said, I hear that people at Ignite want to see future. They want to see what is it going to look like in a year? What's it going to look like next year? How far can we take this thing? So we put together a little vision video of a potential future. Now, I have spent a lot of time upgrading .NET applications. I upgrade my .NET sites from like .NET 3 to .NET 8, or .NET 9 just came out. I might take a, a site from 6 to 9, and I use the .NET Upgrade Assistant. We've got a really interesting video that we put together here. I'm going to do it on this one. That is, this is a video where we're going to right click and we're going to say upgrade with GitHub Copilot, and we're going to have kind of a combination of the things that you've seen with Copilot and that code within the agent or within the extension that is how to, uh, that understands our code because the, the existing upgrade assistant works really, really well. So similar to what Jesse was showing around multi-file edits, this thing is going to go and look at eShop and upgrade it to uh, .NET 8. It makes a branch. It's using Upgrade Assistant to go and upgrade that. It's very verbose, and it's calling out all of the issues and all of the incidents, all the warnings, things that are mandatory, things that are not, and it's telling me at every level what it's doing. And then at any point, if I wanted to, I could open it up and see you know, what's going on there. Again, this is a concept of a possible future. This is all real, but it is edited for the speed. I think this actually is quite a bit longer than a minute because we've fast forwarded a bunch of stuff. So here's an example where an error couldn't be fixed, and then it might ask for a human. I need some help. Because it's an illusion if you think you're going to go and take your enterprise customer and upgrade their legacy application in a minute and a half. That, that is nonsense. But if you could sit down with an expert system and walk through a conversation with an expert system and get all of the yucky bits, oh, shoot, upgrade all of these from Jason uh, Newtonsoft to system.text.json. That's not a do it and it'll work on the first try. It's a conversation or an iteration, mm -hmm. as you said. So you can see here how this is then saying, all right, well, the upgrade assistant did this. And then Copilot just did that. And then we're going to need the developers to step in on for that. And we have some ideas around guidance as well. So I think that this is a really cool future. Now, we've got a Java version of this. But this is the .NET version uh, that is being conceived of. You can go and learn more. So take a picture of this slide if you want to sign up and learn more, uh, aka.ms slash upgrade slash copilot slash .NET. And that is a theoretical future that you could maybe be a part of. If you're excited about that, let us know, and we'll reach out to you. This is one you want to take a screenshot of as well. So every single thing that we showed you is either in GA or in previews. And then a couple things at the very end are coming soon. So take a look at this here. All the icebreakers are there, prompt libraries there, debug test failure, which was awesome. All of that exists. Previews one and two coming very, very soon. And then a little bit later, things like the web search function, the image attachment stuff. That was totally real when you sent that. Mm -hmm. It's just on an internal build that Jesse is running and not something that's available yet. Someday soon. Fair? Mm -hmm. Cool. So that is a tour of all of the cool stuff that's happening on GitHub Copilot in Visual Studio. I think it is considerably different and considerably more powerful than what you may have seen when you spent time with it kicking the tires maybe a year, year and a half ago. So I would encourage you to take a look, check it out, break it, talk to us. Because when you send the feedback, you're going to be talking to real humans that are really, really interested sincerely in your feedback. Because it's getting better because y'all 
talk to uh, us. So I want everybody to give Jesse and Dahlia a big hand for their hard work on the project. And there is, a, there is a cast of thousands on Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, and our friends at GitHub to make all of this stuff possible. Thank you very much, and have a great show. We'll see you later.